So last year, I think, I think about last year, I thought we've been demonising sugar and carbs. I'm going to, for an academic argument, try and work out what's the toxic dose. Mm-hmm. This is interesting for your listeners. I've, in the talks, actually, carbohydrate, the dose is the poison. It's on YouTube and stuff. And it's been, hasn't, you know, I don't, really haven't got any negative feedback from it because I came up with an academic argument that four grams of glucose was the toxic dose. Now, that's one teaspoon. That's one-fifth of a slice of bread. It's one bite of an apple. It's not, it's not very much. But at that level, sugar, and we'll say half fructose, half glucose. Mm-hmm. So fructose has got, and so if you go to my talks on nutritional model of modern disease and inflammation, or, or that's where I talk about fructose. We didn't know about fructose until about 2010, 2011. It just wasn't in the literature. My textbooks just is fructose, fructose 6-phosphate, and then there's nothing. But we just completely ignored it, even though there's been some researchers, Gerald Reeven, for instance, has been talking about it in his books there for 30, 40 years, but completely ignored. But the definitive metabolism of fructose was pretty well worked out in 2010, 2011. Journal of Physiology looked happy. So Professor Tappy is from uh, Switzerland. I have actually met him. I specifically hopped on a flight to ask him one question. So the guy definitively described fructose. I said, Professor Tappy, is there a human biochemical requirement for us to ingest fructose? I knew the answer. I warned him that I was going to ask him the question publicly. And the answer is no. We do not need to ingest a single bit of fructose. And the same goes with glucose. There is not a single biochemical pathway in the body that requires us to ingest glucose. So for, we're all told that glucose, carbs are important. And by, they're either glucose or fructose or combinations of them. Have we ever considered, and this is my hypothesis, that the body, the bloodstream, hates glucose and fructose so much that it does everything in its capacity to get it out of it? And if you take that premise, which is an alternate view, you know, it's going back to inversion, that one man's answer, you know, look at things from the opposite thing. You look at how much the body does to get fructose and glucose out of the system. So carbohydrates are only naturally available in seasonal fruit, mm-hmm. honey, and breast milk. That's it. You know, people talk about grains. Well, no, it's not seasonal. You know, that, you've got to, that'll destroy your teeth. Early agricultural revolution, uh, revolution populations didn't have any teeth because they tried to chew it and it just ground their teeth down. They, they learnt to brew it into beer and mead, but they couldn't eat it. And so, therefore, um, when you start looking at what it does, so fructose, when you get fruit in the wild, and we're just animals, we're meant to stuff our faces with it to get fat for winter hibernation. Mm-hmm. That, that's it. Think about fruit because that's the only natural source. Honey is, in fact, seasonally available as well because the, the bees only produce it in the, in the spring, summer, into a bit of the autumn, but that flowering season. And if you raid a beehive in the winter and take away that winter store of honey for the bees, you'll kill the hive. So bee, honey is actually only seasonally available. And the bees are storing honey for their own survival. And I say to people, if you really want to eat honey, then climb into a wild beehive, crack into it, and if you can get some honey out of that, good luck to you. We've actually got just up the slope here, I've got, a, a, I've got a, an old tree with a, a wild beehive in it. And it's inside. There's just no way I can get into it unless I burn the thing down. I took our grandkids up there and I just watched all these bees swarming in and out. There's no way I'm going to go into that beehive. So the only seasonal fruit, the thing is, is seasonal carbohydrate is fruit. And it's, when you look at fructose, that component of it, it drives behavior. So fructose has multiple things. First of all, it comes up into the liver. It's rapidly metabolized into the liver. And it has effects that will actually effectively store it as fat. But it also has an effect on the hypothalamus to actually stimulate hunger. It has an effect on the nucleus accumbens in the brain, which is the addiction center, which is like heroin, as others have referred to it like that. So it stimulates and drives this behavior. It has an anti-leptin effect. Leptin is the hormone secreted by the fat in your body, which actually 
tells you that you've had enough. So it actually tells you to just keep eating. It has a ghrelin effect, which is the hormone which makes your belly rumble. It makes you feel hungry. It also has an effect in a pathway called the aldehyde pathway where it gets converted into alcohol in the liver. So that makes you soporific and laid back and at, uh, monkeys in the wild that gorge themselves on fruit on a tree lie around in an alcoholic stupor after it. I mean, it's all the animal kingdom's been telling us this. Yeah, we, you, you can watch all that. Then uh, it's also got a pathway where it gets metabolized. The metabolites go into uric acid. Uric acid is that interesting thing which people associate with gout, but we've got great more gout in society now, but it's related to us eating more too much sugar, not too much red meat, and not too much alcohol. Uric acid has an effect on inhibiting our production of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a critical hormone which keeps our blood vessels open, keeps supply going to our brains, and it allows our white cells to be involved in the immune response. So when we eat too much sugar, we affect our blood supply to our brain, we increase our blood pressure, causing hypertension, and we reduce our immunity. So those people with high blood pressure, if they take sugar out of their diet, then bang, all of a sudden their blood pressure comes down. Their immune improvement, immunity improves, which is diabetes, and the blood supply to the brain is stabilised. That you know, That's just one pathway. We can then talk about ketone effects on, on the brain. That's... Uh, and the fructose gets converted, the fat storage portion of it gets converted into small, dense LDLs. Now, lipoproteins involved in our fat storage. And unfortunately, if they get oxidized, they are the inflammatory ones that go to every corner of the body. <clears throat> Losing that voice. <clears throat> That's fructose in a nutshell. I mean, I've covered a lot of biochemistry in that. And again, it, it's, go to YouTube and look at my talks on nutrition and inflammation because I, we, that's where fructose fits into that. So that was fructose. Um, so how is glucose metabolized? I mean, glucose is used by virtually every cell in our body. So can we allow for glucose? I mean, fruits are made up of glucose and fructose <coughs> combination. But if someone's eating just pure glucose, for example, is it as harmful as fructose to their overall metabolic health? I think so in a different way. You said that glucose is utilized by all cells. Glucose can be utilized by all cells. Okay, there's a thing called the Krebs cycle. Hans Krebs described it as where, where fuels go into the cell, into the mitochondria, and get converted into ATP, and then adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy molecule of the body. Uh, and it's the same energy Krebs cycle that's in an animal and an insect, not a plant but it, all living creatures have the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle can equally take in glucose or carbohydrate or glucose. It can take in proteins and it can take in fats or ketones and metabolize them into the same pathway. So you're quite right, glucose, but it can be utilized by all cells. But all cells in the body, bar three, and are the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, some cells in the lens of the eye and some cells in the kidney, called the loop of Henley, very thin cells, and maybe the ends of some of the nerves use glucose exclusively. But that small amount of glucose that they require can come from gluconeogenesis, which is done in the liver where you break down um, protein, or it can come from the breakdown of fats, <clears throat> and specifically the glycerine backbone of the, the glycerine side chains of a thing called a triglyceride. So glucose is used, but again, it, it, you know, I, as I say, why you know, people say, oh, I need to have carbs all the time. So well, actually, why was God so stupid to make us completely dependent on one seasonally available food product? Well, God's not that stupid. I mean, I'm anti-religious and I make a statement like that. But I mean, God made us available, you know, to eat bioavailable, complete foods which are seasonally available in carbs or all year round in animal-based product. So glucose is an interesting one because again, we're only, you know, the metabolism of the primary metabolism of it actually pretty simple. We've known about that for a long time. 
but the secondary metabolism and the other effects of it is relatively new. So when you put glucose into the bloodstream, the blood does everything in its power to get it out of the bloodstream. And it does that under the direct effect of insulin. And then insulin will store it away into muscle as fat, into the liver as fat. And it does that, it just takes it out. But if you keep eating carbs in and in and in, then you end up with chronic hyperinsulinemia, elevated secretion of insulin. And then ultimately, you can only put certain amount of fat into your cupboards. You can only, and then that starts flowing it back into the liver. You end up getting more trouble with the liver and storage and more troubles with fat in the liver and alcohol in the liver from that glucose and fructose metabolism. And then that then comes, comes along with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, of which 8% of 10-year-olds now have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Children who have got cirrhosis of the liver or developing it. I, I, I just I, I touched on something, but someone might pick me up if you're really clever about that. I talked about glucose being associated with fatty liver disease. If you're insulin resistant mm -hmm. or obese, then 30% of glucose gets metabolized back into fructose. And that was the king, that was the king pin for the lynch pin for me when I was working that out. It's called a polyol pathway. And so when you actually so therefore you not only have people having eating too much fructose, you have 30% of the carbohydrate that they're eating getting converted back into fructose. That's the runaway train. <clears throat> so, so first of all, 30% of glucose gets converted back to fructose. That's that pathway. The rest of glucose is pushed into the bloodstream, into the tissue <clears throat> under the effect of um, insulin, which is fat storage. And you can only do that for a certain period of time. Two things I want to dwell on, which aren't really well known. And one is, um, have you heard of the glycocalyx? No. It's the biggest organ in the body. Okay, so most people think, oh, the skin's the biggest organ. But we've got in the glycocalyx is the lining of all of our blood vessels, particularly our arteries and our tiny little artery, arterioles and the capillaries. And it's like this sheath, like these little fingers that actually move the blood along the bloodstream, the, the little, move the red blood cells, the white blood cells, particularly through the capillaries. And it creates that sweeping motion. Nitric oxide opens that up at the tissue level so the red blood cell can be pushed down the path. Direct effect of nitric oxide. So that glycocalyx is around about 1500 square meters. You know, it, it's not, it's, it's so much bigger than the skin because you can imagine the surface of every blood vessel. Now, if you apply carb glucose to that, it immediately damages it. And therefore those people who've got diabetes, their glycocalyx thickness in the blood vessels is around about half of what it should be. So the ability to push your cells down the pathway, down the blood cell, down the, down the, down the blood vessel is damaged by the effect, direct effect of carbohydrate by glucose. Remembering that 30% of the glucose is converted to fructose, the fructose gets converted to the uric acid. The uric acid inhibits the nitric oxide, which is trying to do that job. So you've got a primary damage to the glycocalyx. You've got a secondary damage to the nitric oxide, which is trying to get the, the blood vessels open. That's a bit mind blowing, isn't it? Mind you, I was mind blown when I found it. And so if you get control of your diabetes and you get control of your blood glucose, then in fact, your glycocalyx regenerates very quickly. But those people with chronic diabetes and chronically blood elevated blood glucose, particularly if they're going up and down like that, have a chronically thinned out glycocalyx. Now, when that glycocalyx is not only involved in this movement, it's also acting as a barrier to stop antigens or abnormal proteins or things across into the tissue. A lot of people have heard of leaky gut. Mm -hmm. We've actually got inflammatory gut disease and proteins, particularly plant proteins, will come along to those, literally get into the bloodstream and then can create the allergic reactions and the sensitivities. And the same thing's actually happening at the glycocalyx right through the entire body 
under the direct effect of glucose and the anti-nitric oxide effect. So anyway, that, that's another pathway. So another, th here's a, a, one, a favourite one, it's a thing called the Maillard reaction. Before we move to that, Dr. Pesca, do you mind? I have a couple of questions. Um, so you said the it obviously thins down the glycocalyx, but and, and but is it can it can it repair itself? Yes, we, we, literally within hours. Within hours. Within hours, the glycocalyx will regenerate. regenerate. So you can have a whole lot of carbohydrate, 50, 50 grams, fifty hundred grams of carbohydrate, it'll smash that glycocalyx within eight hours, probably around eight hours that'll restore itself very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we've got the ability to turn that around very quickly. But if people are having carbohydrate all the time, six, yeah. seven times a day, so it's dun, 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 so you're chronically smashing that glycocalyx. Is glycation, diabetics are prone to glycation in their joints. And as an okay, orthopedic right. surgeon, you probably know of that. Is that <clears throat> related to that? Because I suffered with frozen shoulders thanks to glycation, thanks to the diet I was following, thanks to um, the uh, UK diabetes uh, guidelines. I was eating tons of carbs and I was trying to match and control my blood sugars with insulin. And of course, it didn't work. And I ended up with two frozen shoulders, refused all medication. I'm still recovering for it, from it four years on completely naturally by normalizing my blood sugars, but I'm not quite there yet. I don't have full rotation well, in my, it, either of my arms yet. Every, every patient I saw with um, a frozen shoulder, I would do a diabetes test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were a proportion of those that had diabetes. So, so I'm gonna answer that, I'll answer, you, you brought up two topics and I'll, I'll answer them sequ sequentially. One's glycation and the other one's joints. So the glycation one, I think is really interesting. It's a really easy one to understand. And it's called the Maillard reaction, M-A-I-L-L-A-R-D. It's a cooking term. Everyone knows it. When you cook food, it goes brown. So if you get a piece of bread and you put it in the toaster and you heat it up, the glucose in that combines with the protein, caramelizes and goes brown. So in your blood, when you eat glucose and your glucose goes up, a portion of that goes up in the bloodstream, but a portion of it, about two thirds of it goes into the tissue. Particularly if your glycocalyx is thinned. Mm -hmm. So it goes into the tissue and then under the effect of body heat, you have a combination of the glucose combining with the proteins in the soft tissues and you have an effective toasting of the tissue. So every time you've got diabetes, someone, your blood glucose spike, you are slowly but surely toasting your brain, your eyes, your kidneys your limbs, everything is getting toasted by the Maillard reaction. So glucose in the tissues is not good. Anything above a normal blood glucose, remembering we've got, we need to keep, an, we need some glucose in the bloodstream. We keep that up by this thing called glucagon, which breaks down fat and it's involved in gluconeogenesis, but it keeps our, uh, so we've got all these mechanisms to keep our blood glucose at a certain level. We've got these other mechanisms to drag it down so it doesn't get too high. So that glycation, that Maillard reaction is why you don't want to have any blood glucose spikes because each time you had a blood glucose spike, you're causing direct toasting, which is largely irreversible. So the glycocalyx, reversible. The Maillard reaction, low grade chronic inflammation, not particularly reversible partially over time, <coughs> excuse me, which comes down to joint disease. If you look at cartilage damage in joints and tendon damage and adhesive capsulitis around the shoulder, if you look at the tissue, you find the end products of glucose metabolism. You find the glycation of the proteins in the tissue. The glycaminoglycans, which make up the, 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 the binding tissue within a, a cartilage, joint cartilage, gets damaged by that Maillard reaction. You don't find the end products of protein metabolism. You don't find the end products of fat metabolism. You actually find inflammation. You might find some traumatic inflammation, but the vast majority of the brittleness of your cartilage, the brittleness of your tendons is that Maillard reaction occurring at every joint, 
every tendon. And it's all, it's all carbs. So if you look at, I mean, I've got a mate who's uh, right into uh, uh, forensic archaeology. And if you look at pre-agricultural skeletons, pre-agricultural, so we're going back 10,000 years, you don't see the signs of osteoarthritis. Um, I've got so many patients over time. Oh, I'll, I'll come back, back to joints as well. Insulin, when you actually eat carbohydrate, you produce the insulin to store it as fat. That insulin has two other effects. One is as a growth hormone. So the most important hormone in the growth of cancer is insulin. The other thing is it's got, it's a major inflammation hormone. So that work came out of China in 2020. So not everything bad came out of China in 2020. I say that you got to think of it as good stuff, which showed that osteoarthritis of the knee in particular was under the direct influence of insulin. So when your insulin went up, arthritic arthritis and synovial inflammation, which is the lining of the knee joint goes up. When they reduced insulin, the inflammation went down. Now I know that paper wasn't written by a low carver because the Chinese would said, we've got to target insulin in the management of arthritis. No, you don't need to target insulin. You just need to reduce carbohydrate intake. The body will produce less insulin. So I effectively just you know, advise all my patients have for some years, stop eating carbohydrate. And those people that do that have a major reduction in their symptoms of whether or not it's osteoarthritis of the hip or the knee or the neck or the spine, whatever, they have a major reduction in their symptoms. I've got a, a friend, uh, the same friend who's right into the archaeological side, he's actually a shoulder surgeon. And he's pretty well had to retire because all of his patients with shoulder cuff troubles. He said, I'll book you in eight weeks for surgery, but I want you to go low carb keto in the interim period. 80% of his patients cancelled their surgery. Those that didn't cancel hadn't done it. So it, again, I'm on record for saying, I think we, op, we over operate too much as surgeon or orthopedic surgeons. We're not hard enough on our patients to say, you've got to make the lifestyle decision. However, I understand why as healthcare professionals, we haven't done it because we haven't been given the tools. We've been told, I'll go away and eat properly, eat by the food pyramid, go and see the dietitian who's been educated by the cereal industry. Go along, we'll give you these drugs because we've been educated by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we believe that meat causes all these things because we, our education has been tainted by the Seventh-day Adventist church. We've been completely surrounded by what I call disinformation, deliberate misinformation. It's very hard to break out of that mold. But if you actually do give people the chance of actually have a complete eating nutritiously rather than for calories with a complete amount of proteins, complete amount of healthy fats, micronutrients, then all of a sudden, if you support that person, they get better. And then they tell the next person and the next person, and then the Yuri does it. And she goes, hang on, I'm going to, I, this has improved my life. I'm going to do a podcast and tell another lot of people. And that's, it's such a powerful tool because I can guarantee I'm not making any money on this. I can guarantee if you are, you're making bugger all. It is, we're doing, and the people in this space are doing it out of the passion because it's empowered my life, it's empowered your life, it's empowered our children's life, our family's life, my patient's life, my community, blah, blah, blah. And that community is no longer just here around me in Tasmania, it's nationally and internationally. And so what, it's such a powerful tool, but it's really important to understand who's stopping that tool because the biochemistry is simple. You know, when you break it down, there is no human biochemical requirement for carbohydrate. Plant-based foods are incomplete in proteins, incomplete in healthy fats, incomplete in micronutrients, and in fact contain a whole lot of anti-nutrients, whether or not they're lectins or pectins or phytates or oxalates. 
and the the the, the irons and things like that are not bioavailable. So whenever you hear that plant-based is the way to go, well, in fact, it's not. It's you're going to be micronutrient and macronutrient deficient, but you'll get plenty of carbs, of which you don't need. Mm-hmm. So it, it the I, I, I almost get lost for words because the answer is really as simple as eating our entire health equation is let's eat a complete nutrient dense diet and then the majority of people will improve whether or not it's overall weight or diabetes or autoimmune disease or um, mental health or it's just such a powerful tool but to do it you need to actually break out of the mold of what we've all been told and what we've been surrounded by. This reminds me of uh, when I interviewed Dr. Troll. He uh, <laughs> he uh, he's, he said something along the lines of uh, um, when I did the opposite of uh, the dietary guidelines, the exact opposite that led me to good health. Um, <laughs> so now you you're saying the same. Is there any hope for me to recover fully from my uh, frozen shoulders? I don't want any medication, or maybe I'm wrong in refusing medication. I know they will have an an impact on my blood sugars. But now that my um, A1C is normal range and my blood sugars are improving, actually, the longer I'm sticking to this, the better they're getting. And the more meat I'm eating after 30 years of being vegetarian, the, the healthier I'm getting. I exercise, I'm lifting weights, I do resistance training every day. Is there any hope for me to fully recover from my glycated shoulders? Well, just in case the medical board are watching, I'm not giving specific medical or nutritional no, advice now, Mary. I will put a disclaimer in the <laughs> bottom as well. Oh, no. I mean, the, the cha- first of all, you're improving. And whilst you're improving, you're obviously not going to have anything done. I mean, I kept on saying, I'd see people, okay, well, you do this. Not, look, I'll see you in three months or I'll see you in six months or come back and see me if you're not improving. Because I think if you stick with it, you're going to continue to improve. The question is how much, how much is irreversible? I think it's, it's a very hard question unless we start doing biopsies on you or do it, you know, examine you as an autopsy, then wake you up again and then keep you living for another 10 years. All that we can say is by reducing inflammation, which taking out the sugars, the carbs, the, the seed oils in particular, the, you're going to, you, your body has a remarkable ability to heal. If you allow the white cells, the neutrophils, the T killer cells, the, killer, the cleanup cells, the helper, T helper cells, all those lymphocytes, we put them in the optimal situation, they will do a remarkable job of improving everything. The half-life of an industrial seed oil like linoleic acid or the omega-6s is somewhere about about four years. So people who want an instant fix, you can reduce the insulin effect of inflammation straight away. You can reduce the sugar and carbohydrate effect of of inflammation straight away. But to reduce the industrial seed oils, the vegetable oils out of your system, that takes time. It's really been, a lot of work's been trying to work out how long that is. There's a professor of oils in New York by the name of Greg Lawrence. He's written a book all about oils. Um, And I found a great article by him where he's describing it. And I, I wrote to, I contacted him and I said, I've got this question, what's the half life of it? omega-6 fatty acid, you know, the industrial seed oils. And he said, I'll read my book. So I, I, I got a copy of his book, shipped. I read it and I said, to, and I wrote back to him, I said, you haven't actually answered my question. I've read your book, I, you know, we've done all this literature, and not, not myself, but all these others, what's the half-life? And then we had this great discussion and probably the half-life is around four years. So therefore, to get with half-life, meaning it reduces by 50%, another four years, it reduces by another 50%. It may be only a few months, but it's certainly a long time. And I love telling, I love telling this little story, but when our daughter was about 16, 
We got off the airport and she asked for some McDonald's chips. She was starving, just wanted Macca's chips because, you know, highly processed and addictive behavior and she's, she was a teenager. <clears throat> and she knew how I felt about the whole concept of seed oils at that point in time. And she looked me in the eye and she said, Dad, I promise not to get pregnant for four years. So she made an informed decision knowing that it was going to have an inflammatory effect on her body. And I don't know of a single father out there who, when their 16 year old daughter promises not to get pregnant for four years, isn't going to hand over a couple of dollars for that. Mm -hmm. So again, if people want to smoke nowadays, that's fine. There's so much information about the harms of smoking out there. If you want to smoke with all the public information that's out there, okay, you've made an informed decision to be an idiot. I think it's so hard for people to get make an informed decision about what to eat because there's so much information. And I've come along here and I've undermined all these public officials, all these public documents with what I'm saying. This is anti-food pyramids, anti-dietary food guidelines. You go online and do any of the government guides to healthy eating and I will fail if I do them and you actually do a low carb ketogenic healthy fat lifestyle, whether or not you go to carnival or not, but even low carb healthy fat, the avoidance of cereal grains, margarines, seed oils, then I fail. I literally, I, I, I average about 23% of, of what I should. I don't even get to 50%. And I get this little summary and I do them regularly. And there's, you know, this ABC in Australia is doing a big program to try and make everyone healthier. So I went and did thing and I just got this, you know, really nasty thing. You are doing everything bad. Well, so but I didn't have the opportunity to write back and say, but I feel, I feel good. And my lipid profile is perfect. And I'm not on any medications that I was on. Years ago. And I, my blood pressure is good and I don't have diabetes. My HbA1c is 4.3 or something like that. And my insulin level is very low and, and my liver function tests are normal. And what are you going to do about it? Like, you know, it's literally, I personally have taken back control of my health. This is my story. And if I put a CGM on my arm, I flatline. You know, I'm not flatline dead, but I'm just like, that's boring. You know, just whatever I eat, it's just, just toggles along. Goes up a little bit with exercise, but that's normal. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that opportunity is there for everyone yes. if they want. But then you've got to believe me, or you've got to believe all these guidelines which are getting trumpeted out by society, which has been completely shaped by vested interest. Dr. Fetke, talking, uh, coming back to glycation, uh, you did mention uh, issues with tendons. So where does uh, um, bent fingers, arthritic bent fingers come into this, for example? I know it's a uh, 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 Obviously, arthritis is caused by inflammation, but a lot of diabetic people also get uh, locked fingers, locked fingertips. In fact, I have one. Um, I have one of my fingers is locked and it's not painful, which means that there is no inflammation there. It just doesn't hurt anymore, but it's just bent at the end. And I, um, of course, this isn't medical advice, but talking to other type one diabetics, they're having locked fingers all over. And I, so what's happening there? Well, the, the term locked finger is probably a bit of a loose term to an orthopedic yes. surgeon, okay? Um, but you've got low grade inflammation mm. in all of those joints, which have been there for as long as you've had type one diabetes, which is poorly controlled. Yeah. So that glycation has occurred and arthritis is much co more common in those people with diabetes. Yes. Um, and there are ten, there's a thing called a locked finger, which is partly related trigger finger with, but that's a tendon issue in the palm. Mm. Um, again, more common in those people with diabetes. And so therefore it is all part of a spectrum that if you, the, the more you look at it, the more you see chronic inflammation in every corner of the body. And all I'm saying is the most likely primary cause of that, whether or not it's inflammation or it's autoimmune, comes back 
to our carbohydrate and industrial seed oil intake. And we as a society have just worked so hard to screw it up. But we've done it with the best of intentions because the dietary guidelines for over 100 years have been telling us to do it. And all I'm just saying is the dietary guidelines have been written by the processed food industry for 100 years for their profit and their profit. So their profit is their financial side and the profit is P-R-O-P-H-E-T, which is Ellen G. White, Seventh-day Adventist Church, so that we can all turn into vegan, vegetarian, so Christ will return. And that stuff, I hope Linda mentioned it. In 2019, there's a journal called Religion, which acknowledges everything I've just said about their influence on the dietary guidelines of the world, where they are in the World Health Organization, United Nations, where their links up with everything. They're completely integrated into, 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 into our culture guidelines and it's been deliberate and everything I've acknowledged, I've said is actually acknowledged in that article and in the references is Belinda's work. So the, she's contacted by people, current Seventh-day Adventists, ex-Seventh-day Adventists who completely agree with her every week. Senior people within the Adventist church have been contacting her, not just the person on the street. So we're not anti-religion. Not at all. We're anti-propaganda, which is actually not being done scientifically. So if you actually base your science on biochemistry, which is all I'm doing, this is the biochemistry. I'm not making this up. This is the, the biochemistry of an animal, an insect, a human. We're all the same. We may have different guts, like a cow has all these Oh, this is a great little sideline. This is a little <coughs> moment of, oh, wow, God, I understand that. A cow, let's say, for instance, a ruminant has these, a cow has four, four guts to ferment grasses. Everyone talks about gorillas being vegetarian and being incredibly strong. They've got this enormous hind gut, large bowel to ferment. But what's really interesting, whether or not you're a cow or a human or a gorilla, what goes up the portal vein are short chain fatty acids. So therefore the cow will ferment everything in the foreguts to move up the portal vein, which is the main vein from the gut to the liver into short chain fatty acids. Chimpan the, the gorilla does exactly the same thing, but we don't have four stomachs and we don't have a massive hind gut or large intestine. So therefore our only way of getting that in is to eat it. Mm. And the only way you're going to eat it is animal based foods. So if we go and eat a whole lot of grass or plants, we are not, we don't have the ability to ferment that in our foregut or our hind gut. So it, we, it, we're not getting it, So it's silly to think that we're cows. It's silly to think that we're gorillas. We need short chain fatty acids. And the only way we're going to get that is if we eat it. The only way we're going to get that is if we're actually animal based product. I mean, end of topic, you know, or if someone you know, reminded me the other day, you don't see caveman paintings of them eating lettuce. They're, they're hunting. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, we evolved. Our evolutionary diet is around animal based product. And in times of starvation, in times of plenty, you know, it's times of starvation. We might have scrounged around for some root vegetables. In times of plenty, I mean, the fruit was around, we'd stuff our faces with it so we could actually get fat for winter. But it's got no, there's no evolutionary benefit or biochemical benefit from eating sugar and carbs. And in fact, in the amount we're having now, it's just toxic. And wild fruits and vegetables, before they were hybridized <laughs> and Tiny. sweetened, they were, uh, um, yeah, they were, they they weren't as carby. I mean, they weren't full of glucose, and they weren't sweet, and they were probably bitter. You mentioned these, I think, in some of your talks. Um, so people would have uh, preferred to avoid them, and they were toxic. A lot of the vegetables out <coughs> in the world were toxic. So, um, well, the plants don't want us to be eaten, and they put all these things in them to actually not be eaten. So the only way we can eat vegetables is we boil them or we ferment them mm. to actually get rid of some of those anti nutrients in them. 
I, I, I don't know if in my fruit talk uh, about is fruit good or bad for you, I talk about why fruit wants us to eat it. Again, just think about it from all of this, I think it's part of inversion. Think about it from the reverse aspect. Why does fruit want us to eat it? That's really simple. It wants us to propagate its seed, remembering we're just animals. And it, it, the fruit hasn't worked out that we most of us could just you know, propagate the seed in a porcelain bowl so it doesn't actually get out into the garden. But if, so therefore fruit advertises itself by getting shiny and sweet and bright and catches our eye. But it also comes with a whole lot of fiber to give you the trots so that you poo it out quickly. So you have this rapid transit time of, of fruit seed in your gut. So it gets thrown out the other end. And so is it any surprise that 40 to 50% of those people who have irritable bowel syndrome have a fructose intolerance? And again, so it's so many people when they drop sugar out of their diet, their bowel settles down, their inflammatory bowel, just sugar, let alone the glucose and the, the, the seed oils in, in later combination. And so many people who decide to go keto or so many people who decide to go carnivore see a massive improvement in their bowel situation. And fiber is completely overrated. You know, it's again a carbohydrate, it's a non digestible carbohydrate. The only things that can actually do anything with the bacteria in the gut. Bacteria in the gut actually don't need, uh, fi doesn't, it doesn't need fiber to actually create. Um, what do you call it? All the all the micronutrients that we have. Mm. It, it's. I'm not saying that we, you know. I'm not saying don't eat vegetables because I think the vast majority on the planet are omnivorous. But if you actually have a variety of sicknesses and health issues and you don't get better by eating well, whatever that means, or I know what that means, but don't if you don't get a benefit by eating low carb, healthy fat, which is where I you know, believe in that, then some people move towards keto. But some people actually need to reset the system by being, doing carnivore. And then they reintroduce stuff back into their diet if they want to. And it's everyone's personal choice. And I don't know where people are as individuals on their health journey, except that I know the data which says that 93.2% of the population are metabolically unwell. And so therefore, primarily that's because of what they eat. It's not about running, going out and doing more exercise and getting, it, it, I mean, it is important to get sunlight. That's another thing. Mm -hmm.